Master Chief's armor has a fatal flaw that actually makes it suck as a body armor. I know, that's a pretty bold claim, especially coming from a content creator who has made multiple, nearly hour-long videos on Mjolnir Powered Assault Armor and how awesome it is. Even going so far as to take on Project Mjolnir, creating a real-world, real-life version of Mjolnir with modern technology as close to lore accurate as possible. But the fact remains, there is a glaringly obvious fatal flaw in Master Chief's armor that makes it, well, crap. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we're diving into the structure of the lore and the canon of the Halo universe to actually make heads to tails of this bold claim that Master Chief's armor is actually pretty terrible. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with the fact that Mjolnir Powered Assault Armor is actually a formidable, extremely powerful suit of armor that the Spartans wear. It boosts their reaction time, their strength, fully supports their already impressive superhuman physicality grants them up to 62 millimeters, that's over two inches, of enhanced titanium alloy armor. It uses impressively advanced movement and articulation systems, has a full body energy shield, a full heads up display suite that allows the user an enhanced understanding and awareness of the battlefield, and is powered, and is powered by nuclear fusion, granting it a continual supply of clean energy for 15 years of continued usage. Again, I've covered this rather remarkable set of armor extensively over my YouTube career so far, and to get a feel for that, obviously you can look at any of my videos, and it is immensely powerful, but there is a flaw. A flaw that was massively apparent with the Mark IV platform, but still persists to this day with the most recent Gen 3 platforms and it has to do with the energy shields, or more specifically, the lack of energy shields, or when the energy shields are depleted. But in order to get to grips with this, we need to understand how the law and how the canon of the Halo universe is kind of graded. Now by this, I mean that all the law and all of the canon that's been established in the extensive and expansive Halo universe is technically subject to something of a tier list. There is some lore, some canon, that is ranked more canonically accurate than other lore and canon. But how do we differentiate which is which? Well, this stems back quite simply to what the franchise is at its core. And what it is at its core is a game, a gaming franchise which means that the most highest ranked lore and canon, the stuff that's most canonically accurate, is the things we find in-game. That is above all what is canonically accurate. Now, this is also subject to something called the Rule of Cool, which is something that was put in place by Bungie, where basically if something was cool, even if it didn't make a lot of sense as per the lore and the canon and even the physics of that universe, if it was cool, it got into the game. So there are some things that don't make sense based on that. But above all else, everything you find in game is the highest and most purest form of canon. Next, but marginally subordinate to the in-game lore, is the lore and canon from the books. All of the novels that have been written by its myriad authors are still very hard and fast lore and canon in the grander universe, but if something new happens in the game that contradicts what happens in the books, by definition, the game series of events takes precedence. This is what initially happened when Halo Reach was released, in that it retold the events of the Fall of Reach, which to many people's minds contradicted what the books had laid out. But in doing this, the game series of events became the true canon, and then the series of events that happened in the book was subordinate to that, but have since been somewhat rectified in that the two series of events now coexist quite happily. This doesn't necessarily stand true for the next tier of canon, and that is that ranks slightly below the books, 
any movies or animated series or anything like that that's been produced for Halo. That's a tier down again. So the likes of Ford Unto Dawn, Halo Legends, Halo The Fall of Reach, the animated movie, and Halo Nightfall all rank as kind of a tier 3 canon, which are subordinate to the books, which in turn are subordinate to the game. This also presents a slight issue because in the series of events portrayed in Halo The Fall of Reach, the animated movie, they were slightly different to the events portrayed in the book Halo The Fall of Reach. In this circumstance, the book takes precedence, despite the fact that the animated movie many would consider as being a higher fidelity form of media told in the Halo franchise and thus should in theory rank above the books, but this is not the case. As for the Halo TV show, it technically ranks in a tier list in and of itself. It's a completely separate timeline, the Silver Timeline, independent from the mainline canon and lore. So we can't really factor that into what we're discussing here. And finally, any miscellaneous lore that's extrapolated in audio dramas such as Hunt the Truth, game trailers, concept art books, and any miscellaneous lore established in things like Halo Warfleet. All of this ranks below the movies, which ranks below the books, which ranks below the games themselves. But it's not that all of this canon and lore in these different tiers exist separate, independent and self-contained from each other. In truth, they can all coexist quite happily, except where there are contradictions in the lore. If there is a small snippet of lore that's established in an audio drama, but that contradicts lore established in a live-action movie, the live-action movie takes precedence. However, if the lore established there is contradicted by lore that's established in the books, the books takes precedence. And again, if that same piece of lore is contradicted by something in the games, the game takes precedence. So that's somewhat, that's a r rather fast and loose way of saying it. There's, there's some subtleties involved in it, but that's a rather loose way of structuring and understanding how the law and canon is kind of graded to each other. And therein lies our problem. In the books, Master Chief's armor is remarkably resilient. It's made of a multi-layer titanium alloy that is impervious to nearly all small arms fire. Now, small arms or small arms fire is defined as being weapons that are portable, the portable firearms, particularly rifles, pistols, and light machine guns. Now again, there are obviously some caveats to that. For example, armor-piercing rounds or high-explosive rounds are obviously going to do more damage to the titanium alloy of Mjolnir than would a hollow point or even a full metal jacket. And you can't specifically define the sniper rifle, for example, the 50 cal BMG as being a small arms fire because by definition it's an anti-material weapon. Not technically supposed to be used against personnel, but there are ways around that. But in either case, the law in the books is absolute. It states very clearly that Mjolnir powered assault armor is a multi-layered titanium alloy of remarkable strength, making it impervious to most small arms fire. That's what it says in the books. Yet, in the games... I think you'd see where I'm going with this now. So the canon makes it abundantly clear that Mjolnir is a remarkably strong powered assault armor, yet that was established in the books, and yet in the games, a Spartan without energy shields can be one shot in the head with a very small caliber weapon. Case in point, the sidearm introduced in Halo Infinite fires a 10mm round. That's actually one of the smallest rounds that we've ever found from a weapon in game, and yet one single round kills a Spartan without an energy shield. And don't get me wrong, there are smaller rounds than the sidekick, for example the M7 SMG fires a 5mm caseless round, but the SMG just happens to be a weapon that doesn't actually technically trend as a headshot weapon. So it actually takes 10 5mm SMG rounds in order to kill an unshielded Spartan via headshots. But this is again more so down to gameplay mechanics in that the gun itself isn't a headshot weapon, it isn't a precision weapon. 
Another precision weapon that has a relatively small caliber is the Covenant Carbine, which fires an 8.7mm round, but again this is a rifle so it fires it at a much higher velocity and likely with more of a punch. And since the Carbine does kind of double as the Covenant's answer to the battle rifle, it's kind of no surprise that a single shot to the head with an unshielded Spartan equals a kill. And there are a few other guns with relatively small caliber rounds, so for example, anything that fires needle rounds. The needles, on average, based on my estimations, are approximately 5mm across, and uh, we all know what they do to unshielded Spartans. In any case, the point I'm getting at here is that for a remarkably powerful powered assault armor, a powered exoskeleton that's supposed to protect the wearer, Without the energy shields, based on in-game law, which is supposed to be the highest tier, the highest quality of cannon, a single 10mm round fired from the sidekick kills a Spartan without energy shields. Which means that ultimately whatever alloy the helmet is made of, or maybe composite the helmet is made of, performs very poorly as far as ballistic protection is concerned. And it can't even be argued that it's the visor that's giving way, because you can still kill a Spartan without shields from behind with a single shot from a sidekick. And in thinking about it, this does kind of apply to my Project Mjolnir helmet. So I said that it was a real-life Mjolnir helmet made with modern technology, modern materials, as close to law accurate as possible. And of course, understandably so, I got lots of people ask in the comments, is it bulletproof? or can we see it being shot at? Considering that the helmet itself represents about 27 grand worth of investment, I can't quite stomach the idea of shooting this thing at the moment. Maybe down the line, but not right now. However, the grade of titanium that is used in the shell of my helmet is the same grade of titanium that was used to 3D print Adam Savage's Iron Man armor. I've put a link in the description and at the top of the comments to show you to that video and just what punishment that stood up to. Which means, based on the material properties of the titanium I've used for my Mjolnir helmet, my Mjolnir helmet performs better as a ballistic protection than the Master Chief's own helmet does in the lore. So, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, that's it then. Thanks for watching. If I could respectfully ask, if you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Hit this video with a like if you enjoyed, and if not, it's not a problem. And be sure to pop a comment below to throw me an idea on what you want to see next. Massive thanks to my awesome patrons, Spartan10148, the Metarch of my facility, Falcon, Prophet, Leon, Sylphia, Mikhail, and Irrefutable, the monitors of the array, Darian, Flaming Halo, Cameron, Spartan0137, The Cave Potato, Andrew, Shia, Dakota, and Ghost, my diligent sub-monitors, my fleet of strato-sentinels, and my loyal enforcers, and all other patrons who have supported the channel and helped keep the domain operational. Huge props and recognition to Todd Morrison, Spartan137, Wesley Stuckey, and Jacob Kemp for jumping on as Tier 0 Transcentient YouTube members. You guys are epic. Shout out to John for reasons. And if you want to help support the channel and score yourself tons of perks and merch, head over to Patreon or consider becoming a YouTube member. Links, as ever, are in the description. Much love, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>